a day of the Lord. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Zechariah, Amos, Abadiah, Zephaniah, and finally the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations. And in Obadiah against Adam and Esau. Christianity. And the nations. Basically they're saying the Gentiles in general uh, and in particular the Christians. Those who told you to get down and walked all over you. Those who took your book and called it their own. Those who told you your God had let you and came to them because you were such sinners. But isn't it funny? The only reason they don't consider themselves great sinners is because of a human sacrifice. God gave to them so he wouldn't see them as sinners, but he saw his people as sinners and left them. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near. But it is not the end of the world. The wicked and sinners will be punished and justice established. These are some excerpts from those books. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah Chapter 13, verse 9. For a day is near. A day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt, and Nubia shall be seized with trembling. When men fall slain in Egypt, and her wealth is seized, and her foundations are overthrown. Nubia, Put, and Lud and all the mixed populations and cub, and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel, chapter 30, verses 3 to 5. Yet even now, says the Lord, turn back to me with all your hearts, and with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than your garments, and turn back to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. That's Joel chapter 2, <laughs> verses 12 through 13. <laughs> but everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape. For there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's Joel also, chapter 3, verse 5. For I have noted how many are your crimes and how countless your sins. You enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert in the gate, the cause of the needy? Assuredly, at such a time, the prudent man keeps silent. For it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you, as you think. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. That's Amos, chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. Thus said my Lord God concerning Adam, Christianity. I will make you least among the nations. You shall be most despised. Your arrogant heart has seduced you, you who dwell in cliffs of the rock, in your lofty abode. You think in your heart, who can pull me down? to earth. 
Should you nest as high as the eagle? Should your eye be lodged among the stars? Even from there, I will pull you down, declares the Lord. Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 1. And I will be bring distress upon them, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Zephaniah, <clears throat> Zephaniah, I'm not sure how to say it. Zephaniah, thank you. Chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. As for those peoples that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot away in their sockets, and their tongues shall rot away in their mouths, etc. It goes on quite a ways. As Zechariah, Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 12 through 17. Just on a side, just because we were cutting up and being funny, myself in the spirit of the Holy God, who is a person. We couldn't put these videos on if it hadn't been for the coronavirus. It was my stimulus check, the, pan, uh, the, the relief check uh, because of the virus and the need for everybody and stimulate the economy. That's how I got this camera and a little light and this big TV behind me. <laughs> In spirit, ask God. We asked him, I said, uh, you didn't have anything to do with this plague, did you? So that we could get this stuff? <laughs> he said, of course not. <laughs> we looked at each other and he said, uh, <laughs> we wouldn't put it past you. Any event, <laughs> we laughed for an hour over there. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. It is God's final word on the day that he is preparing where a scroll of remembrance will be written at his behest concerning those who revered the Lord and esteemed his name. That would include heed the Lord. He does not address the nations, but only Israel and its people. It is written for the return of the Roman dispersal. And why do we say that? It's because of the new covenant. See, a time is coming. Days for the day of the Lord. Because one of the seed of times is coming is Jerusalem is rebuilt and then it ends with and you shall never be defeated and overthrown again. Yet Malachi 3 in the, where God makes his declaration of the day of the Lord when he returns with his messenger who clears the way for him and the new covenant the new covenant arrives with the angel of his presence. There's no other way to to uh, comment on that. that. That's who the angel of the covenant that you desire is. It's not the friendship covenant, it's the only other covenant out there. And I will bring distress upon them that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung as I just read from Zephaniah Okay, this is destroying sinners in the day of the Lord. And then this. Yet even now, says the Lord, turn back to me with all your hearts and with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than your garments and turn back to the Lord your God for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. That's from Joel chapter 2. Okay, these are examples of writing for the people of antiquity. In the dark ages, that is prophecy, but has nothing to do with the day of the Lord and God's final words on the subject for a time to come, as announced in Jeremiah 31 of the New Covenant. In the day of the Lord, he comes with his messenger and the angel of the New Covenant of sin forgiveness, not to destroy sinners or require their repentance, which I hear all of the time. He'll come when we get all the Jews to stop sinning and to be observant to the degree that we as human beings are capable. 
That would be from Jews for Judaism. And see, they rely, their interpretation of Isaiah 53 is the people Israel, the Jewish people as Israel, is based on the Messianic era occurring. You throw that out, and he's got nothing to back up that Israel fits all 12 verses. It's all based on that. It's all based on the nations and their leaders, the kings, saying, oh, we've been wrong about the Jew all the time, exalting them, holding them up high. Rip. Okay. Not to destroy sinners will require their repentance, but to forgive them and give them another chance. He also amends the first covenant to be mindful of the teaching of my servant Moses, whom I charged at or with laws and rules for all of Israel, rather than strict compliance. And this is how Malachi starts again. Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. It's Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And keep that in mind, because Jesus Christ uses that verse that I just read, Malachi 3 and 1, to describe John the Baptist, his cousin, as Elijah. But there's some interesting twists to it. The angel of his presence brings the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, technology, that his righteous servant might not be recognized, believed, or heeded. The other destruction of, I think it's, it's verse 24, I think, maybe 23 and 24, is simply on its way of chapter 3, Malachi. Just like it was with the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Romans long ago. Today that would be Islam. God is his creation. And it's, he, he's not going to personally come down and destroy it as he did Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just, it's just another way of saying I'm going to raise up armies. You know, that were already there. The Jewish people didn't heed his prophets and they were destroyed. Taking all of these verses of Malachi 3 together, including God returning to his temple, which must be rebuilt, with his messenger clearing the way before him, a new covenant where God forgives the inequities of the Jewish people and remembers their sins no more, which I have said is just an amendment of the first covenant, the preparing of a scroll of remembrance for those that revere and esteem his name and heed him and Entry to heaven, and being mindful of his teachings and laws as observant Jews rather than strict compliance. The concept of the day of the Lord by all previous prophets is changed. The utter destruction prophesied, save for a surviving remnant, is alleviated. There is no mention of the destruction of the nations. It is implied that there will be destruction in the land of Israel, though not necessarily utter destruction. It's the way he phrases it. If you don't do this when I come, it is with utter destruction. Well, does that mean when he comes there's going to be destruction? But it's only utter if his prophet is not successful? Elijah, in this case, who is, has the same purpose as the righteous servant. To build the third temple, there will be war. 
in the Middle East causing destruction in Israel and the loss of life among the Jewish people, but it is the building of the third temple that prevents their utter destruction by the nations against Israel. And this goes hand in hand with when you rebuild Jerusalem, see the time is coming, I'm coming back. I have the covenant of friendship with Moshiach, my servant David the shepherd. I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you, and you shall never be defeated and dispersed again. He has to come back. I mean, that, you see, when you get Jerusalem rebuilt, I'll come back. I, you know, clearly he realizes the temple's not here today, and he knew it in the times of Jeremiah. He knows it has to be rebuilt. He knows he's going to have to be part of that. And to do that, he has to have a Moses. A somebody who can say, this is what we do next. And he's got to have generals listen to him. And he's got to have, he's got to have the Knesset listen to him. In all probability, in my opinion, he won't tell me again. He doesn't tell me anything of the future. I have to figure it out for myself. Things that are natural to, to ascertain, uh, we'll talk about. But uh, I think it would be something like the Six-Day War. I don't think Israel will initiate taking that mount under almost any circumstances short of uh, a plot by Islam, including the Palestinians, to bring in a, a nuclear suitcase or two. Something like that may, may spark things without being attacked by Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon and everybody all at the same time, Iran and their back test Baba. <clears throat> Defeating the enemies of the nations that come against Israel and the sanctific sanctification of the land and the people blessed by God with his presence in his sanctuary is how utter destruction is avoided in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. A day that is not one day, but would begin when he comes to prepare his righteous servant, who is to be his virtual representation and spokesperson to at least, until at least, his return to his temple. A day that establishes and makes certain that the Jewish people will never be defeated and uprooted again. The Lord's way is cleared only if his righteous servant, who is Elijah, the shepherd David, the prophet like Moses, and of course the righteous servant. One description, four men. He can handle it all. But the way is not going to be cleared if the verses are being shunned, despised, thought to be afflicted by God, by the Jewish people, we're not going to get there. But I believe that changes based on the later verses. Observant and secular life, accepted as the shepherd David, a leader to tend the flock and be a ruler among them, not as a king with a kingdom, The day of the Lord is the last prophecy of God. In that day, all remaining prophecy of God in the Hebrew Bible is fulfilled. The sending of the prophet like Moses, the descendant of King David, and Elijah, with the delivery of the new covenant and the covenant of friendship, all fulfilled in one man. Through one man. The man God calls my righteous servant. One God of Israel. One angel of his presence, and one man, his righteous servant, a man and divine beings, a host of the Lord's host, who is God's virtual representation, his spokesperson, and a man he has absolute and total control of from his mind, emotions, and body to his every act and his every word. And I am that man. I'm 
it's not something you say lightly, I can promise you. That you're listening to a man in divine beings, that they are here right now, speaking to me as I read these things, having me skip when they want me to skip through mine. <laughs> I said, you got to give me some of those. Come on. <laughs> he said, we'll give you some of those. And I see him change, his, change words that I'm saying. Uh, back, back to this uh, Malachi 3, 1 and John the Baptist as Elijah. First and foremost, historically it cannot be him. Because when he comes, when he comes, that would be when Jerusalem is rebuilt. Because he's in Malachi 3. And, and that, of course, is the verse Jesus uses. Okay, but let's just say, let's go back to his time. Number one, the temple was there. I don't know what he was clearing the way for. And uh, God would, had been coming with a covenant of friendship to place his sanctuary there. I don't know why he put that in a covenant. But the most important part is it says when Jerusalem's rebuilt, which of course was already there, but when it's rebuilt, the Jewish people will never be defeated and dispersed again. Well, 40 years after the death of Jesus in 70 Common Era, the Jewish people had their first of three great revolts against Rome. They were decimated. Over 50,000 lost by some accounts. And eventually, this uh, defeated and dispersed from Rome with the temple being burned to the ground uh, during the first revolt. There was two more revolts actually after that. Um, and Elijah, of course, he, he died long before Jesus did, had his head cut off, put it on a platter. Uh, and his people came to Jesus, 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 John, your cousin. Well, they didn't say your cousin, John the Baptist. He, he wants to know, are you who you say you are? As in, I'm in bad trouble. I need your help. And Jesus' answer is, go tell him the blind see, the crippled walk. He didn't go heavy. He said, go tell John that. <laughs> like the character. But it just gets better. Why is he saying John the Baptist is Elijah? You think he doesn't know about the book, the scroll of Jeremiah? Never be defeated again. This is the man who said all the prophets said of him, he'll ride an ass into Jerusalem and be executed. But the only prophet who even talks about it Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, the Messiah shall ride a mass in Jerusalem. Verse 10, and defeat them and call on all the nations to surrender, become king of all, which I suppose would be the Middle East. Well, he just changed it. He just flat out lied. You know. And <laughs> he let his cousin get his head chopped off. Lazarus had to lay dead for an extra day because he was late. Kidding, man. <laughs> I don't know. But here's the problem. We, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, God's kind of surprised me with this, but I know it well. Malachi 3, verse 1. The end of it is, and the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Guess what Jesus left out? There's no mention of the angel of the covenant that you desire. It's intentionally left out. It is a deception of no small means. He left it out. And why? He can't put it in. Or, Jesus, what's the covenant? Uh, sin forgiveness, written <laughs> of all the Jewish people. He can't put it in. So he left it out. But he had it. He had to, but. He had, at calling himself the Lord, he had to have someone clearing the way from him, and he couldn't get around that part of Malachi 3. God says, I'm coming. And I'm sending my messenger before me, to clear the way before me. It doesn't say to build the temple, but God says, and then I shall return to my temple so, suddenly. So I believe that's the best way to uh, interpret that. Just left it out. Well, anyway, uh, I think that's a good elaboration on the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord. You know, those those early books before Malachi, they're for the people of antiquity. 
It's to scare them and to stop sinning. It's just to scare them. You know, God's not going to come down here and kill every sinner. He obliterate the planet. And um, in Malachi, he's coming with sin forgiveness. You know, I'm, I, I'm making a school of remembrance. You'll find out that's for a heaven that I'm building just for you, creating just for you, my Jewish people. I mean, it's so far removed from the concept of a day of the Lord. Um that you just kind of perk up. It's because why? It's see a time is coming. It's a prophetic day of the Lord, so to speak. It's not one that is imminent. It's around the corner. It's there will be a time when I come back, but I'm coming back. Sin forgiveness. I'm telling you, you only have to be mindful of my laws and my strict compliance. It's the same covenant. It's not. It's new only because it's an amendment. He includes plenty of confirmation that. I am your God, and the Jewish people are, uh, are his people. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it.